Trass houses. <laughs> it's eventually used as fuel to boil and hence refine the sugar from which it came. Yes, and now, Serena, your turn. A truss is a term that chairmakers use. It tells you the angle of splay of the back legs of a chair, so that if you have a very low kitchen chair, perhaps a rather uncomfortable one, it has a low area of splash, uh, of truss. And uh, <laughs> you're splashing down. And uh, if you have a Windsor chair, which perhaps more people like to collect, there's a very high angle of truss. Well, it's this strange grey <laughs> stuff that you use for hydraulic cement, and it's this um, the, the angle of the chair leg, the back leg of the chair, and it's sugarcane stalks after the sugar's been removed. Frank can choose? You can. I mean, I have a choice. Yes, yes. So I'd rather it might not. make it more interesting. Well, no, no, no it's, funny. it's very interesting this round, very interesting. Um, <laughs> angle of truss of chairs might have heard it, one of us might have heard it at some time, but it seems such an unlikely word, because it sounds like truss, which is, and tris and trish and trash and things. I'm not sure a technical word would be so close to other words. Pumice stone from Germany. It is well known that pumice stone was invented and important to this country by Lord Pumice Stone, after whom it was... <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and... Uh, You've got the wrong note, people. So <laughs> and people who live in truss houses <laughs> built, built from the waste. What well, people do, and the waste of sugar, the actual cane, is burnt to, to produce it. But is it called truss? We think it is. We think it's the sugar cane. That was uh, Peter Egan's Wastage. definition. Was that true? Was it a bluff? <clears throat> oh, dear. It's a bluff. I wonder what it really is. What is trash when you really come right down to Simply it? Simply hydraulic cement. Simply <laughs> hydraulic cement. <laughs> <laughs> What's hydraulic cement? Yeah, I Don't really think. Me. I think we should, as they say, draw a veil over that. But it certainly is this sort of pumice substance that you squash up and make a kind of cement from. And MOBA is the next one at this, this interesting juncture. Frank? It's medieval. Um, <laughs> it's, well, you've got to get the A and E. Medieval. Um, and it's the, the, your Welsh lord, your Welsh lord on his march. Uh, is, um, has got his estate. And if you're a tenant farmer and want to marry a girl from the village, uh, you have to pay, you had to pay, the lord of the manor a fee for, for marrying a girl. And it was called an amoeba. What a drama. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty rotten thing, wasn't it, really? Now, Alan Garner. It is, in fact, Paddy, pure drama, in that this one is not Latin, but Greek with a deprivative prefix, a, and it is used uh, to describe an interlude, divertissement, or a recitation of songs and poems uh, in between a performance of plays in a Greek amphitheater. Oh. Yep. <laughs> and um, Angela? An amoeba is a distant relative, but very distant relative um, in terms of distance and, and its makeup of, of the house fly. It's found in Australia, and it's, it's a rather small fly that likes to lay its eggs in dark, warm places. And the eggs of an amoeba fly have even been found within the pooch, or pouch, rather, of a kangaroo. The pooch of a kangaroo. That's what the pooch of a kangaroo. There's one that's like a dog. <laughs> even, even the kangaroo of a pooch. It's a Greek recital of songs, sort of interlude, a Greek recital of poems in between other sorts of entertainment. Sort of a fly and um, a sort of uh, feudal fee paid by the Welsh, uh, Patrick. What was all that? No. <laughs> don't, don't, don't tell me. I'm just trying to guess. No. Mid. Eight. Australians call flies flies, I think. I'm pretty sure of that. Well, they add a few words to it. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Greek play or divertissement? No. 
相手が呪われてんの<笑> ?You think it was the Welsh、yes, medieval、uh, thing? Yeah, show up, love, Frank. Hang on. It's there. Is it true or bluff? It's a bluff, isn't it? Oh, it's true! <laughs> well, 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 yes. <clears throat> it's, um, it's this Welsh due that is paid if you have to marry the girl and、um, so forth. Five, three, and、uh, I better ring the bell. Nearly forgot. Ruit is the next one. Peter、oh, yeah. Egan's turn. Doing、Shall、that.、Uh, Ruit is a smaller than average size、uh, trumpet that may be made to measure for a boy bugler. Or Ronnie Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> you don't half say them quick, do you?、Yes. Right. Serena, your turn. Ruit is a very tender expression of regret. You know, when you fail to write a thank you letter, when you've not told the person you love that you love them, that's what you've got. You've got this ruet with you all the time. That's what it is, right?、That's、She says、word. that now. It's Patrick's turn. A ruet turn. was a breed of pig that was used to gallop about on the Isle of Man. I say used to gallop about on the Isle of Man because the last ruet that was seen on the Isle of Man fell off. It was in 17. <laughs> Was in 1794. <laughs> sort of pig on the Isle of Man. He used to run about there and doesn't do it anymore. Small trumpet suitable for a small boy. And a feeling of regret.、Uh, yes, a feeling of regret. Alan Garner. His choice. Oh, we are unanimous in that my、oh, companions tell me that it's what I think it is not. Your, your choice. My choice. <laughs> small trumpet. No. Regret、reason. is too good. <laughs> I have fallen down on Paddy before now, but I have been so severely treated in this experience by Serena that I am going to be malicious and say it's Serena even if it is not. She spoke, didn't she, of it being a feeling of regret, and、uh, she's now rather.、Oh. She doesn't look as if、oh, she regrets it. <laughs> Every time you have gone to the mat with Serena, you have lost. <laughs> well, well. Anyway, so、uh, who gave the true definition of this interesting、picky. word? There's no need to fall over me this time because it's a、ah. clever piece of baby. <laughs> Said it was a it, baby trumpet, a baby trumpet it was. Did you believe it? You didn't, but there. So the score standing at 6 3. Fairly comfortable、uh, win there for Patrick's team. We'll、uh, make another trip to the waxworks next week. Till then, goodbye from Peter Egan. Serena Sinclair, Angela Rippon, Patrick Campbell, Frank Lloyd, and My bluff, featuring the Sage of Egham, Frank Muir. My first guest has been frequently on the other side of the house, but this time it's nice to be on the winning team, and it's the、uh, actress and mother, Nerys Hughes.、Oh. My second, second guest is a writer who, who writes、uh, lyrics for songs, and he's also written a couple of operas,、uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and Evita. It's Tim Rice. Thank you.
And Father O'Flynn's tall, thin brother, Patrick Campbell. <laughs> Never to be outdone by the other team, my first partner is also a mother, and she's an actress as well. Sandy, from Rings on the Fingers, Diane Keane. And the other lad is fresh for canonization, but the saint could only be Ian Ogilvy. Right, see if there's a word there. There must be. The three, or well, anyway. Lung Gom Pa is um, produced as one single word, and uh, that's the word that Frank Muir and Co are going to define three different ways. Two of the definitions are no good, one of them's all right, and that's what Patrick and Co try and pick out. So, uh, Lung Gom Pa. <coughs> Frank? Lung Gom Pa is a Tibetan monk endowed with mystical powers. He is able to walk at the speed of 15 miles an hour. Now, a normal walking pace, as you know, is approximately four miles an hour. But in the Tibetan hills, 15 miles an hour. People have probably put an abacus on him, but nobody has yet put a stopwatch on him to know exactly the speed. It's about 15 miles an hour. But it is recorded that several Langagomba Pars have achieved several hundred miles a day of walking in Tibet. <laughs> right, so that's what Frank says now. Here comes Tim Rice. He'll tell you something. Well, if you're a Chihuahua Indian, then the word Langagomba or Langagomba is just as common as the word canoe is if you're English, and that's what it is. It's a canoe, and it's a very simple, basic canoe made out of a tree and the bit in the middle taken out so you can sit in it and paddle about where the Indians are, who I believe originate from Venezuela. So it's just their canoe. Yep, so that's what he says now, Neris Hughes. A uh, long humpa is a Maori word and obviously from New Zealand and it's three pronged sort of carved wooden stake which they stick in the ground for ceremonies and things and I suppose we Europeans would think it was a trident of some sort but in fact it's meant to represent a thunderbolt, a long hampa. Right, they say that it's some kind of a canoe. It's this Maori staff, sort of sacred staff really, and a very fast uh, to beaten monk, walks 15 miles an hour. <coughs> Patrick. Oh, unanimous here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We believe, with certainty, that it could not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're fairly sure that it isn't a Maori trident, although I don't go away. It would be a canoe, don't you say. People walking up and down mountains at 15 miles an hour. It's a tricky one, Pad. I agree with you there. <laughs> but it's you. Yes. You're darting You're a Tibetan monkey. It was Frank who said it was a <clears throat> fast-walking Tibetan monk, 50 Tibet. miles an hour, draw bluff. It can't be true. Well done, and you did that. That is nicely well done, there. Yes, yes. Long Gun Park is a Tibetan monk who can do that. Bonham's the next one. Patrick defines Bonham for you. It's a carter. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Um, a Bonham... It's an Irish word for a piglet. What? If you've never heard of a piglet, <laughs> it's a young pig oh. that's oh, a still <laughs> living off its mother. I won't go into it by what means. Now, if you should happen to be in possession of a copy of Joyce Carey's marvellous novel called Castle Corner, is it? No, not called. You turn to page 275. And you see a line there, I don't remember which line it is, it says, she was plump as a bonham. I just checked that quotation, a little, little look at my notes. No, she was as fat as a bonham. I want to be absolutely right about this. She was fat as a bonham. What a marvellous I don't know who she, you don't, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> Let me know. I can't remember who she was, but she was as fat as a bonham. Or piglet. 
It was a marvellous memory to remember the page number, but yes, not absolutely. the book. <laughs> <laughs> Castle Corn. <laughs> anyway, now, let, let's see what Ian Ogilvy says after that. Yes, well, if you were a, an American blue-collar worker in the late 1800s, you might wear a bonham, you probably would. It was a semi-protective hat with a curly brim, and it was made of a mixture of felt and goat's hair, which gave it a curiously shaggy appearance. It looked really as though it needed a shave. And that's what a bonham was. It was a, it was a hard hat worn by American workers in the late 1800s. So, that's what you say. Now, let's see what Diane Keene says. Picture, uh, if you will, <laughs> an old-fashioned sweetie shop with rows and rows of jars, big jars full of humbugs and boiled sweets and all those lovely things, and you lift off the heavy lid and you delve your hand in and grab a handful, you will be delving into a bonum, because a bonum is a confectioner's jar made of glass, and you can still find them sometimes today in oldie worldy sweetie shops. Right. It That's seems it's a hard hat worn by blue-collar workers in America. It's a piglet, <laughs> and it's a sweet jar of the old-fashioned sort. So Frank has to pick one of those. Fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be a piglet. Um, <clears throat> Semi-protective hat worn by a white-collar worker. Blue. Blue collar. Mm. Blue. Very. What colour was the hat? There is a medicine. Um, <laughs> This person, this child, stealing sweets from a jar, Bonham, could be... It was the we... jar itself, Frank, if you... Not I don't jar. want you to be deluded. It's, it's, it's irreverent, it's irreverent. It's irreverent. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think clearly it's this ridiculous pig of Paddy's. You think clearly it's the piglet of which Patrick spoke? Patrick, I think, I think murkily that it's the piglet, you, rather than clearly. A murky choice, true or bluff? Well done, Frank. What do you know? <laughs> A bottom's a small pig in Ireland. Nudie is the next word. Tim Rice tells you about nudie. Well, nudie is in fact naudie, and naudie was very big in Edinburgh drawing rooms in the 17th century. It's a card game, not unlike cribbage, and it never really caught on in England except briefly about the same time when it was actually then called for some bizarre reason the Lord Mayor of Coventry. Oh, what a jumble <laughs> of rubbish. <laughs> Bear it in mind, however, as we pass to Nerys. Well, now, D, and I'm using a Welsh accent on purpose because it's a Welsh word, and they use it in the West Country as well, I think, but it is a Welsh word, um, is when a cow has got some sort of hepatitis and it can't actually manufacture cream in the milk, and so the milk comes out all sort of bluey and thin. Yeah. And so um, the farmers say, oh, she's going now, D. Or shall we now, D? Well, Plus she's got hepatitis as well. <laughs> <laughs> they can't be too jolly. It's still good for a laugh here, as ever. Frank, your turn. Be the hat. <laughs> now, D, um, is a word from the private language of boys of um, Winchester School. Now, D. Uh, to your Wickhamist, you didn't go to Wickham, did you? To, to your Wickhamist, uh, a Naudi is a non swimmer, a chap who doesn't, doesn't go in for swimming. Humiliating fact end of summer term, list of Naudis was printed in the local paper. Oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> that is your privilege, Patrick. Well, I, know, I know what my privilege is. They say that it's a card game that was um, also known by another name, the Lord Mayor of Coventry, I think. It's a non-swimmer at Winchester, and it's very nasty milk. You're out on your own. Milk. Ian Ogilvy <laughs> oh, it's me. is out on his own. Oh, charming. That, Usual yeah. help to my team? Yes. Hmm. Well, uh, 17th century... Scottish card game. That was yours, Tim, wasn't it? Yes, I suppose it could be. It doesn't, it doesn't really sound very 17th century, does it? Yeah. Not to me, anyway. Very yeah, good point. And then Frank's Winchester School slang, a very dangerous one. An awful lot of people know Winchester School slang. Well, I'm not one of them, but never mind. <laughs> um, and there is his cow disease with blue milk. Has anybody ever heard of blue yes. milk? Yes. Actually, I rather like that. And, and I'm, um, I'm going to choose Neris's. I think blue milk. 
the blue milk which she, she said was uh, naughty. True love. love. Milk is often tinged with blue, if you've noticed. Who gave the true definition? There it is. It's a card game. It's a card game, otherwise known as Lord Mayor of Coventry. Jum or Jum is the next one. Um, Ian Ogilvy, your love. <coughs> Ogilvy, your turn. Thank you very much. He's stuck in there. <laughs> Drunk again. Please, please continue. Please jum, do. actually, it is. It's jum. And it's a method of cultivating... I can't do it either. <laughs> <laughs> it's catching, isn't it? It's start again. Yeah. Method of cultivating virgin forests oh. east of Chittagong... In Chittagong. Oh. I got that right. I'm not writing that right. Chittagong <laughs> in India. And it's a very wasteful way of cultivating virgin forests east of Chittagong in India because what you do is you take your seeds and you go to your bit of virgin land and you set fire to all the trees and they all burn down. And then you plant your seeds and when they come up you harvest them, eat the stuff, move on, set fire to some more trees, they all burn down and so on, which is why there aren't an awful lot of trees east of Chittagong in India. <laughs> That's a jum. So now we ask Diane Keane to have a go at it. Jum. Look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Please. I was saying a little joke to my friend. <laughs> I have got a quotation for you. It is from the works of the late Mr Robbie Burns, and it says here... The cricket beasties drudge and drive, hog shoulder jum and stretch and strive. And jum is a Scottish word for nudging or jogging or tossling somebody out of the way. Something out of the way. Jum. Silly word. Yep. <laughs> so, now Patrick. Jum is a kind of semi fireproof paste. <laughs> Which is used hydraulic cement in kilns. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've got something, a little pot around about that side, but that round, delicately painted with enamel. If you put all that lot into a kiln, you're going to lose your enamel. It's going to get burnt off. Yes. Yeah. Mm. But you can prevent this burning off by. It is an iron knocker, iron noxer, iron oxide. <laughs> <laughs> Would you paint over your enamel? It's just boring. <laughs> <laughs> Bang it Good. all into the kiln, and when she's fired beautifully, take her out when she gets cold, and wipe the jum, as it's called up in the potteries, wipe your jum off, and you've got the most beautiful jar, enameled and fired. In a shorter time than it takes to describe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sort of fireproof paste. It's cultivation of forest land in India, in a certain part of India, and it's a jostle or a nudge. Uh, Tim Rice to choose. Well, I think I'll try a new method of protection, which is sheer guesswork. There isn't a problem. They're all ludicrous, but two I didn't even understand. So, um, which leaves Ian's virgin forest. Despite that, I'm not going to go for it. I've got this niggling feeling that it's something to do with iron oxide. So, Patrick, reveal all. He did say something about iron oxide. I heard him. I was sitting here. Was that true or bluff? I tried to say iron oxide and did in the end to some success. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't iron oxide. It was something else. What was it? Here comes the true one. Must be there. Must be you, wasn't it? Oh, oh, what? It probably was. was. Yes, it was. Yes, yes. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Two all. <laughs> it is that particular Two left. wasteful, rather wasteful method of cultivation um, of forest land in that <laughs> part of India. To all, trantles or trantals is the next one. Neris, I don't know how you pronounce it. Oh, trantles, mm -hmm. you're right. Good. Uh, trantles are uh, useless things or unwanted things that you might give to a jumble sale, but uh, I mean, they're even. No, you shouldn't give them to a jumble sale, actually. It's like giving one welly or um, a pack of cards that's incomplete or a chipped vase 
or something like that. In other words, useless bric-a-brac. Mm. Yes. Mm. Right. Mm. What's wrong with one way? Well, it's a, it's a trentals. It's an, it's an is, not, not a them. If you see what I mean, it's singular, although it's a plural word. And it's very dull, so I'll do it very brief, briefly. It's, a, it's an iron door down a coal mine. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is normally closed, but sometimes, sometimes they open it to let the truck through. And I don't know why it's there. Perhaps it's to keep the canaries in or to keep drafts out or something, but that's, that's what it is. So, that, yes, yes. and now let's see what uh, Tim Rice has to say. Well, if you're in a monastery situation, <laughs> I, <laughs> if you're a monk or a nun, um, or both, then often there are things you do which aren't actually religious. I mean, there are things that have to be done even in monasteries, like scrubbing the pig or hoeing turnips. And when people in monasteries or nunneries do things that aren't religious, they still sometimes burst into song. And it's usually ad lib with no set tune, no set words. But trantles, or one trantle, but trantles, it's usually in the plural, um, they are ad lib religious songs which aren't you know, to be found in your regular hymn book. Or any hymn book. Mm. Well, it's a door in a mine, sometimes open, sometimes not. It's a nun's or a monk's work song, that kind of thing, and it's bits and pieces you don't want much. Um, Just, uh, don't Diane, start talking yet. We're still in conference. Mm. <laughs> you like a song, oh, Robert? <laughs> a song, only a rose. <laughs> I'm on my own. Yeah, you're on. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> uh, a mostly closed iron door down a coal mine, Frank. Rubbish. I, it's true. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't well, know. But the canaries fooled me, you see. That was what got me. <laughs> and the ad lib chanting that Tim was telling us about in a nunnery or a monastery. I, I, I don't know. I, I just feel that if they did burst into song, they'd have a much more exotic name for something as spontaneous as that. That's a very exotic word, trantles. Do you think so? Oh, well, yes, yes perhaps it is. Yeah, um, it and then, then of course, the useless bric-a-brac. <laughs> useless bric-a-brac. Well, um, I think that appealed to me most. Useless bric-a-brac from Nerith. You choose it. Nerith. Look for him. True or bluff? <laughs> frightened, but I'm afraid Too not clever frightened. clever by half. Ah. Oh. Oh. Is that sort of useless bits and pieces, Rick Abrak? Oh, Two, three, and we have Scopoloit. Oh. And Diane Keane going to tell you about it. Scopoloit is a fishing term. It is basically a wooden trough, V shaped, um, which is used on trawlers. And what you do with it is you get it on the deck of the trawler and you put it down at an angle to the hold and you shovel all your poor unfortunate herrings that have just been caught and they shoot down your scopoloit into the hold. That's a good idea. It's made of wood. Mm. Good idea. Yes. Yes, it, Plus, it, it might idea. be that. Now, Patrick is going to tell us. A scopoloit is a Scottish name which is no longer used, thank God, <laughs> for a divot in the game of goof, as they believe they call it. They, they stole that game anyway from the Dutch and never invented it at all. But anyway, this lot, watching people playing golf, and they see somebody coming down a little bit too quick from the top. So he strikes the ground about a foot behind the ball. And what happened to his golf club? It sticks in the mud. And he wakes up a couple of minutes later, he's flat on his back, about a couple of yards away, because his Scopoloid is too long. <laughs> <laughs> if he pinch the boy, if he come in properly, you see, and his uh, scopoloid had begun just beyond the ball. What is a scopoloid? A divot. <laughs> What's a divot? I'm trying to explain uh, what yeah, a divot that's is. That's the next word, <laughs> Nellis. <laughs> 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 If you don't know what a divot is, I'd is better stop... Is it a man or a club? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a piece of mud that comes out... What's the when... mud? <laughs> that comes a quarter of an hour later, if I haven't been interfered with. Do you feel you've said about more or less enough? Yes. Yeah. Do you think? <laughs> I think it now, Ian, it's your go. Yes. I am afraid I'm going to lower the tone of this proceeding completely, because um, in the Fen country, yes. 
a scopoloi is a larking about, a prancing about, a kicking up of the heels, generally having a good time. And in Cambridgeshire, it has been known for a scopolite, loit, <laughs> or something like that, <laughs> to lead to horseplay of a somewhat improper nature. Get away. Yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> Cambridgeshire. That is scopoloit. You can get trains there, can't you? <laughs> so it's this kind of shoot that you've got to pour the herrings down. Uh, it's the divot, another name for a divot, and it's uh, playtime in Cambridgeshire. So there is. You know a divot is that thing that... The, the divot's mm, the muddy golfer lying I'm with sure his club beside him. <laughs> um, yes, sexy games in Cambridgeshire. Hmm. Yes, it sounds a bit like that, but perhaps that's a bit too obvious, really. And I really couldn't make head nor tail, as you all know, of Paddy's. I, I mean, it, I never did know. It is the mud, is it, Paddy? Yep. It is the mud. It doesn't mud. have to be mud. It can be dry earth as well. What, 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 what you stick in. Yes, I see. <laughs> and, um, well, I think it sounds most like Diane's, uh, the, the wooden trough. For the fish, the yes. The herring so. shoot. Yes. Diane, you did take talk of that, didn't you? Was that true or bluff? She'll tell you now. Um. No. Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no. Let's see who of the other two gave the no, true definition. Let's said. see. No, it turns out. No, no, no. There you are. Thank you. It's having a rollick in Cambridgeshire. The next word is divot. No, it isn't. It's cablish. <laughs> and Frank, you are to cablish or cablish? Cablish. You get a lot of this in um, in Mauritius. Uh, you get a bit in Oklahoma. Uh, you get a, quite a bit of it on the islands and the China Seas. You get a bit of it in Cambridgeshire. You don't get it in Stretton, <laughs> but you get it in Cambridgeshire. Because it's the... It's the debris of twigs and branches, and uh, it's a generic term for lumps of tree and wood, which are left after a typhoon came in the uh, China Seas, or cyclone in Mauritius, or tornado in Oklahoma, or just a gale in England. You don't get it in Streatham because there aren't many trees. But if you had trees in Streatham, you would find cablish on the ground. It has. Um, Medieval, medieval, legal <laughs> overtones, because they were fine for that sort of thing in medieval times. Cablish. Tim Rice, would you like to have a go at it? Yes. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> it's um, cablish, not cablish, as you might think, but cablish, and it basically means uh, let us pray. But it's a call to all Mohammedans, and at the very sound of a cabliche, which it says here, is intoned by a muezzin from his minaret, not by a minaret from his muezzin, but by a muezzin from his minaret. That produces the cabliche, which means let us pray. All Mohammedans will instantly prostrate themselves in the direction of Mecca, which is that way. <laughs> Neris, your yes, turn. Um, a cabliche is, I'm afraid to say, connected to the armpit. And it's a tailor's word, and uh, you know if you have your suits tailor-made, that underneath the arm there's a seam, and, um... <laughs> Put a seam in <laughs> Now, that seam is called a cabbage because it's, it's to accommodate how much you wave your arms around, really, whether to make it fan-shaped so that it can give, or whether to make it quite a tight cabbage so that, um, you know, if you're quite an upright sort of person. It's a seam. Right. It's sort of branches from trees falling about all over the place. It, it also means let us pray, and it's the hole where, where the seam parts to let the sleeve go in uh, on a jacket. Patrick. I think you're on your own, Patrick. I think. Well, well, thank you, but. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh. <clears throat> well, anyway. <laughs> we all ride for. I don't believe that any suit was ever made. You, couldn't, you, you, you don't go into a tailor and say, I wave my arms a, about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so give me plenty of cabbage. Be shrewd. I don't believe that could possibly be. I don't, let us pray can't possibly be cabbage. Debris. There are trees in, in Streatham. Dismiss me at your <laughs> 
I think it's, I don't, um, it's let us pray. <laughs> That's what Tim Rice said. Is it true? Is it a bluff? Slowly, much too slowly. slowly. Mm. Oh! <laughs> I'm sure you all. No, no, not that, not that. Now, who of the others gave the true definition of Cambridge Cable? <laughs> It means um, all those bits falling down from trees, branches and the like, twigs and so on. Corrigan is the next one. Uh, Patrick. A Corrigan is an old Irish peasant word for a flat iron. It's so old-fashioned that you can only warm it by putting it on an open fire. A, a turf fire. And why do they not call it an old flat iron? <laughs> because most of the irons were, were made in those days, of 1880s, by R and W Corrigan <laughs> on City of Mallow, County Cork. <laughs> hence... <laughs> got the phone number. <laughs> <laughs> hence the word uh, uh, Corrigan uh, means an old-fashioned flat iron. Now, Ian Ogilvie has a turn, fairly swiftly. Right, Red Corrigan was, in fact, a cartoon character in the old days, and he was a Canadian lumberjack, and he wore a jacket over his tartan lumberjack shirt, and it was made of heavy wool, and because Corrigan was a famous character and very well known and much loved, the jacket became known as a Corrigan. So a lumberjack wears a Corrigan. Diane, it's now your turn. Corrigan, Lady Druid. Hates Christian, Christian priests, descendant of legendary character, half fairy, half witch. I'll that is a corrigan. I'll stop you there. It's a lady druid, a half, half fairy, half witch, flat iron in Ireland, and a jacket, lumberjack jacket. Frank, with your choice. Do you? Yes. Mm. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Fairly swiftly now, Frank, if you will. Uh, Dal Swift? Do you mean sort of Swiftish, a mini... Swiftish, or... <coughs> You're wasting well, time, lad. Not a flat iron, not a shirt. It's uh, Lady Druid. Lady Druid, no Diane? No question. Diane, you said it, wasn't it? But no, she's looking happy. Bullseye! <laughs> <laughs> that was luck on your part. How do ever guess that? Yeah. yeah. And Corrigan is a lady druid and isn't it nice that uh, we've got no more time for any more words God, so no. both sides win and I th I'm sure you'd want to clap hands for both Frank and Patrick <laughs> no, we'll, have some more, we'll have some more seconds from the Oxford English Dictionary next week till then goodbye from Tim Rice Ian Ogilvy, <laughs> Nerys Hughes, Diane Keane, Frank Muir, no. Patrick McCandle, no. and Goodbye. <laughs> My bluff, the last in the present series, but still featuring the laird of Kilcock Robin, Patrick Campbell. <laughs> well done. He the work. Um, just in time, back to my rescue, an unaccountable draw last week. Lucky. Uh, anyway, um, sharper than ever, I have Diane Keane. And on my other side, with his halo slightly bent by last week, <laughs> the Saint Ian Ogilvy. <laughs> and saved once again for the nation, Frank Muir. <laughs> once again, I have the, the same joint winners as last week. And on my right, I have the delightful Nerys Hughes. <laughs> 
And on my left, of course, the something or other, Tim Rice. <laughs> Meant it kindly, meant it kindly. <laughs> now, here we go, off we go again. Oh, and there's no. a, there's a, it looks as though it's spelled backwards, doesn't it? Opo del doc is our first word. Anyway, Patrick's going to uh, grapple with this one. Three different definitions. Two of the definitions are going to be false ones. One is true, and that's the one that Frank and his team try to sort out. So, um, what about Opo del doc, Patrick? That's exactly how it's pronounced, Opo del doc. It's a Persian word, of course. No. A medieval Persian, even earlier perhaps, because it was brought back to England by Elizabethan travellers. If they stayed in Persia, they got into all kinds of open bell locks, dollars, because it's in Persian it means a stalemate in chess. But the Elizabethan Travellers fell so deeply in love with the word, they brought it back to England, and it turned into being in a state of frustration, a kind of ongoing non fulfilment situation. <laughs> you wretch, Patrick, you wretch. Ian Ogilvy, your turn. <laughs> Oppo del doc is, in fact, an adjective used by very clever archaeologists. And what it means is very complicated. What it actually means is it is of pertaining to prehistoric or extinct Polynesian cultures. And uh, if you want to hear more, you don't, <laughs> well, you're going to get it anyway. <laughs> it's, um, you know those Easter, uh, those stone heads on Easter Island? No. <laughs> <laughs> this could go on for quite a long time. There are, on Easter Island, huge monolithic stone heads. And these are recognized by archaeologists to be Oppo del Doc. Well done. Right enough. Now Diane Keane tells you. A poodle doc. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chain. Soap. Soup. Soap, camphor oil, and rosemary mixed together to form a primitive first aid plaster that one would put onto a gaping wound. In some areas, though, they did recommend that you added oil of earthworms, which apparently was very good. Only in some areas. Good but a, a podal dock is a primitive, <laughs> <laughs> primitive first aid plaster. It's uh, the archaeology of Polynesia, long gone. It's pl a plaster you put on something, but it's not a um, terribly sophisticated one. And it's a condition of stalemate. Frank. Yes, oh. Robert. <laughs> Are you there? It doesn't too obvious, but yeah. Um, oh, yes, mm, perhaps. Yes, I don't know. Uh, I sense from the word uh -huh. that it's n none of these, but that's not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paddy, did... <laughs> Uh, Elizabethan travellers go to Persia. Yes, I suppose they did. Uh, yeah. They uh, went everywhere. Didn't they? Uh, um, mm. but, uh, that's so awful. Chess word. I mean. Doesn't sound very Persian, does it? Does it sound Persian? No, no. Um, <laughs> John, and and this it. polytechnic thing of um, Easter eggs and the uh, islands, uh, all, all cultures which grew. Uh, did I get it right? Not at all. No, <laughs> <doesn't it? laughs> so, so I think, and I say this totally without confidence, that it's the soap. You think it's that mixture which, that which but glued wasn't exactly up the, the, soap, the wounds. You put on things, yes. Diane, you're, you, you said all that, didn't you? Now <sighs> she has to own up. Oh, dear. Sorry, you're right. Uh, what? He's apologising to Tim. Lovely feeling, isn't it? It was indeed an early <laughs> kind of plaster that you were well advised to put on a wound. If you had one. Janny is the next word. Frank Muir will define Janny. Uh, very simple. This it's um, it's an old Glaswegian vernacular word for no. a tram car. The Janny. In fact, there was there is, <laughs> except nobody sings it anymore. Uh, an Edwardian sort of music hall song about it. Ah. Ah. I don't know the tune, oh, so I can't what sing a it. What pity! I can't, can't, if you want to accept that this is not the tune, give it a it go. Would probably go. 
Rhaiden nhw i machanu ond na jami. Na hyn y bwy. The LP will be available for BBC Record. So that's, that's what Frank says it is. So, um, Tim, you'll go. Come with me now to Newfoundland. Yep. If you cross the Atlantic to that well-known ex-colony, um, they have some strange Christmas customs there. One of them is that of a young Newfoundlander going around in heavy disguise, he can be a man or boy, but in great disguise, playing pranks on other Newfoundlandies or Newfoundlandishes or Canadians, whatever. So, really, it's, it's quite simply a chap who, at Christmas, in Newfoundland, goes around playing a certain kind of practical joke in heavy disguise on his colleagues. That's a Jenny. Mm -hmm. And, and now, Nevis, it's your go. <laughs> yes, a Jenny is an extra sail, which um, tea clippers, I don't know much about sailing, actually, so I'm going to say this rather carefully. Um, tea clippers used to get the last ounce of wind, and it's situated just below the bowsprit. Do you pronounce it like that? And... Um, <laughs> uh, People who, who've been sailing for a long time call them dolphin bashers or dolphin strikers. Uh -huh. So, it's Glaswegian <laughs> for tram car, kind of a sail on a ship, and it's a Newfoundland, Newfoundland, I should say, joke. Well, well, a joker, joke the man who makes them cry. You do well to rebuke me there, Patrick. Joker. Uh. No boat that I've ever seen in my entire life ever had a sail underneath this boat, but you didn't know what you were talking about from the beginning there, when you started to open your mouth. I said, I told you. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, oh, where was I? Uh, yes. <laughs> this Newfoundland dish, I thought you said. Newfoundland uh, dish in drag. <laughs> playing pranks. <laughs> That's most important. We get so tired of glass... Norwegian jokes, never mind the Glaswegian songs. It couldn't be. I could sing it again if it would help. <laughs> it's a Newfoundland dish. The Joker. Uh, yes, it was Timothy who said it. Two on bluff. Uh, oh! Oh! Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So, that's what it is. One all at the moment, and um, Adlins is the next one, and I think it's Ian Ogilvy to have a whack at it. <laughs> Not Adlins, Ablins. To sleep, Ablins to dream. <laughs> that's what it means. It is an old rural adverb which means perhaps, maybe, perchance, a blins, it's because I'm a Londoner. <laughs> a blins, you'll believe this. A blins, you won't. <laughs> a blins, it's an adverb meaning perhaps. Uh, right. Diane Keane now tells you a thing. A blins. Have you ever eaten a Cornish pasty and when you finish it, on the plate are all those little bits of flaky pastry? which you lick your finger and you dip it in. Have you ever done that? Those are ablins, because ablins is an old Cornish word meaning little bits of um, food. It's Cornish smithereens, they're called. That's ablins. <laughs> is she on the belt? Right. <laughs> Patrick, your turn. Ablins, as it is pronounced, is the way that a postman carries his bag. <laughs> Over the shoulder, it goes ablins. If the, if the protocol of the garter, not the bit you wear on your leg, but the bit essentially, the, I, the, mine must be lost in the post, it hasn't arrived yet, but if it, <laughs> if it was there, I'd wear it ablins. At the Battle of Cressy, all the bowmen wear the equipers ablins. <laughs> That's what it means, across the shoulder. And the chest. Extraordinary. Good. All right. It means wearing it obliquely across your, <coughs> your shoulder, as Patrick said. It means maybe, and it means bits of food left behind. Tim Rice, to have a choice. I can instantly dismiss the Cornish pastry. Unbelievable. 
It was just impossible. There again. No, I, no. I'm absolutely certain it wasn't that. Right. We're down, therefore, to two runners, and Ablin's, as perhaps, is very tempting. Very tempting indeed, especially when delivered so well. Despite that, the team and I have come to the conclusion <laughs> that postmen and chaps at the Battle of Cressy, or postmen at the Battle of Cressy, would in fact <laughs> wear their mailbags or whatever it was, Ablin. I assume it's a French word, so I believe Patrick. Ah, oh, you do, do you? Yes, it was Patrick. Patrick. Were you teasing Patrick, I wonder, or was it the truth after all? I was teasing with a hammer. Ah. Ah. No, Ablins, Ablin, nothing, nothing. Who gave the true definition of the word Ablins or Ablin? Oh, it was you. So, see. Well done. So, it means maybe, perhaps, it's possible, that kind of thing. Choilers, the next word. Tim Rice is going to define it. <coughs> Come with me now to India. <laughs> Again? <laughs> <laughs> to India, where the choiler is a room in the Indian nick, or cop shop. And uh, it's a fairly crowded place at times, and there are often as many as two or three hundred crunimals in <laughs> criminals, <laughs> or criminals as they're known, um, in the choiler at any one time. It's, it's just a cooler for Indian convicts in the, in the uh, Indian police criminals. stations. <laughs> yes. So that's what it is, you say. Uh, Nerys Hughes? You pronounce this the same, choiler, but it is actually um, a bird. It's um, a clapper-billed bird, which you found in southern Africa. And as you may expect, it's a wader, and it goes digging up little crabs and things like that on the beach, and it makes a funny little noise when it digs them up and eats them, goes, up, 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 like that. What? Sort of, well, it, it's a little difficult to reproduce, because I haven't got a beak, Paddy, but it sort of makes a clapping noise with its beak. Oh, yeah, I see, I see. You've got a note of that. I've got a note of all that. I think it's Frank Muir's turn now. Observe. I take up an ordinary dinner knife. I hold it by the handle, and you will observe the blade, ordinary blade. Now, at the bottom, just as it goes into the handle, there's a curve. Now, in the cutlery industry, that curve is called the choil. And to cut that curve, to smooth it out, you take a file called a choiler. <laughs> it's, a, it's a file for making that curved bit of a knife that Frank described. It's a big room in an Indian jail, and it's a wading bird. Ian Ogilvy has to choose. <laughs> Yes, Indian room in a prison, just because it begins with CH, and a lot of Indian words begin with CH. I, well, I thought it was a little bit yes, pushy, indeed. really, Tim, frankly. And then Frank's file. Pitiful, wasn't it? It really was. <laughs> a file. I mean, these things are cast. You don't have little men filing away on the backs of blades. I, these things are made in their millions, you know, hundreds of little men doing this. No, that's not on the top. <laughs> So we're left with Neris's ridiculous bird. Yes. With a clapper bill. If it had a clapper bill, could it really pick up all these little oysters? And oh, yes, very easily. Mm. And oh, well, then it's it. yours, then. Then it's your bird. You convinced me it's your <laughs> bird. That was Neris, wasn't it? Well, true or bluff, my dear. No, wow. nothing. <laughs> Who gave the true definition of choiler? Well, yeah. there it is. Oh, it was so, so away there. Let's yeah. see it. Prove it. <laughs> that was unbelievable. He didn't say anything about little men doing it. He just said it. You know, someone did it, and there you are. Two all. Oh, it's a jolly nice word, isn't it? Nev Locklish, I suppose. Diane. Yes. Nev Locklish. It's a form of verbal shorthand which was invented by a reporter who worked on the Francisco, San Francisco Examiner. 
His name was Nab Nabokel. Nablokel. I can't quite say it, but it was something like that. Anyway, that's where the word comes from. And it's a form of shorthand, and it, uh, you get it by putting, you, you advance the consonants one letter, so that call my bluff, for instance, would be dams come on. A fair description. Rather <laughs> 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 testing oh, shorthand yeah. that would be. Yeah. Anyway, Patrick. I'm sure you'd be glad to hear that Nablocklish is an Irish dialect word. <laughs> <laughs> if you find it, it is very day, you can find a little bit of, of the wilds of Connemara and Galway in between the German and Japanese factories. <laughs> you could be told, I'm oh, Nablocklish. It, it just means don't bother me, leave it alone. You know? Or the French would say laissez faire. But in a blocklish, it is <laughs> a Connemara. If I, I go on with that, it doesn't matter. There's, there's no, no bother. <laughs> Ian Ogilvy's turn. Now, blocklish is a Jewish word. Um, it's a very highly refined vegetable oil, which is used in certain religious ceremonies. And it's poured into a tabash, this very highly refined vegetable oil called a blocklish, and it's anointed around the synagogue. No blockfish. Everybody would slip over, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the point, Frank. Yes. Cheer everything up. It's holy oil of that sort. It's a kind of shorthand invented by this man, and it's Irish for leave it alone or don't bother. Neris. Well, frankly, I thought that Paddy sounded Jewish Irish anyway, the same way he said. Oh, I don't know what to say to that, really. Um, leave it alone. Do you, no, I don't think it's that. And the vegetable oil, that sounds a bit unlikely too. No, I think that because Diana had difficulty describing it, she wanted to get it exactly right. <laughs> I think it might be you. You think it might be yes. she? Yes. Diane, you said it was some kind of shorthand invented by a blockhead or what was it, nab blockhead or something. Mm. Well, Two or what you said, yes, one of those. Oh, it's black fine. <sighs> It wasn't a shorthand of that sort. Who gave the true definition of Nablocklish? Here we are. Jewish the maestro Jewish himself. Jewish. We're all going round in Connemara saying things like that. Uh, Mumba is the next word, and Neris Hughes is going to tell us. Yes, a mumba is an African word um, that, you see, when the Bantus uh, want to go out somewhere, when the Bantu men want to go out somewhere, well, they always take their babies with them and they have an old age pensioner or somebody like that who <laughs> looks after the babies because they always take all the family, the mother, the granny, the babies, however many there are. And uh, so... Uh, a mumba, <laughs> a mumba, is a sort of babysitter in Bantu. You're I thought they took them out when they. <laughs> <laughs> she was right, mother. Yeah, it's sort of babysitter, right? Uh, now it's Frank's turn. It's a mumba sport. Hmm? It's a mumba. What? Oh. It's a mumba, mumba. Oh, um, oh. That's how you pronounce it. It's a mumba. Were you to find yourself in the city of Melbourne? Ah. Oh, Australian accent. Ah. Yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> Scottish. <laughs> Scottish. The accents are only approximate on this programme. <laughs> the best of times. Should you find yourself in Melbourne, in Victoria, Australia, in the springtime, you'd find they have their own version of a kind of carnival come celebration. The kind of their own Mardi Gras. And you'd think they'd call their own version Maddie Glass, wouldn't you? But they don't. They call it a mumba. Yes. Good Lord. Now, Tim Rice has a go. Come with me now. To Ceylon. To Ceylon. And in Ceylon, mumba is an alloy. Well, it's an alloy wherever it is, but it's, uh, it, the actual name comes from Ceylon, or Sri Lanka, as I believe it's now known. And it's an alloy, more or less zinc and copper, welded together as one. And it's used for making all the sort of things that you would use if you were in Ceylon, like bangles, bracelets, things to keep your stomach in, things to push your chest out. 
ornaments. Any more? I've got a whole list of things here. No, 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 that's, that's, that's quite enough, thank you. Well, anyway, it's this festival in Melbourne. It's kind of an alloy, kind of a babysitter. Diane, your turn to choose. Yes. <laughs> yes, we haven't quite conferred mm. on this one. No. No. <laughs> Frank. Yes, dear. Spring in Melbourne. It's a lovely time of the year. Mardi Gras. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't... No, you see... I thought you said Mamba, you see. Well, it's, it's my pronunciation, which... Oh, is it? It's not... The, no. Uh, well, it just didn't sort of... I wasn't convinced. I didn't picture myself at Mardi Gras in Melbourne. Mamba? Um, I don't... Oh, good day. <laughs> <laughs> um, making... Things to hold your stomach in in Ceylon, Tim. <laughs> the mind boggles. Stomach. But then, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Um, I, I, well, no, I didn't. Didn't appeal to me enormously. Um, Neris, <clears throat> the Bantu. I didn't quite understand. You see, why they need a babysitter when they take the baby with them. Oh, because if she starts crying and stuff like that. I see. <laughs> uh, uh. Frank, I think I'll go for spring in Melbourne. Oh, spring, spring in Melbourne. Frank, you I did say, didn't you? I was hoping you would. True or bluff? I said it was. Oh. Oh. Ah. <laughs> that was true. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a festival in Melbourne. They don't call it a festival. They call it a mumba. Pen penal. Not penal. I don't know. I'm Patrick, fair game. your turn. A penal is a nickname, and still is to this day, for a freshman at most of the German Heidelberg. Any university in Germany is bulging with penals. Because it, 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 it comes from the old days when every freshman a little leather case for his pen. He put, after he'd written with his pen on paper, he put it back into the case, it was a little lid, with the result that every freshman, it's dying out now certainly, was called Ein Panal. He was a pen man with, with a little leather case on his pen. For his ballpoint? Is it? No, pre-ballpoint. Oh. Right, so, <clears throat> Ian Ogilvy now. Tim. Sorry. Come with me, if you will, <laughs> to Warwickshire. And the other two can come along too, if they like. <laughs> and I want you to imagine that you've got a table that's wobbling, or a window that's rattling, or any of those irritating things that I won't have. stay put. <laughs> and in Warwickshire, a panel is a little wooden wedge with which you stop windows rattling and tables wobbling. And that's what a panel is, it's a little wooden wedge. How in useful. Warwickshire, that's useful. Yes, <laughs> really. yes. <laughs> Let's find out from Diane Keane what she says. I want you all to come with me. <laughs> Delighted. Back down the centuries, picture a young girl, shy, blushes a lot. Got it. The cure for this <laughs> is penel leaves, which is like a form. It's got large leaves, it's like a garden mint, but it has very large leaves, and you rub the face with the leaves, and it is supposed to stop you from blushing. Penel. So it's a wedge in Warwickshire. It's something you rub your cheeks with if you do a lot of blushing, and it's something like mint, and it's a freshman in a German university. Yes. Frank's choice. Oh, wait, why? Is it? <laughs> I thought it was yours. I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Get my notes I was you like trying that. to think of feeble little jokes. Because well, you had all over again for you. Jolly it along no. a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> what were they? What about... <laughs> it, it was the, ah, yes, the <laughs> pen case rubbish. That's no good. The wedge. <laughs> wooden wedges. They don't have wooden wedges with Warwick the names, do you? Yes. you? They do, do you? Yes, I do too, I reckon. And then there was mint yeah. that the you rub on your face. Her. The blush stopper. That's stopper. That's rubbish. That's, it's supposed to mean fennel, you see. We're supposed to confuse. Yes, fennel. quite. Um, so it's either between the wooden wedge in Warwick yes. <laughs> or the uh, the pen case. Oh, Lord. Difficult. You think, you, you both say that and I say the other. Well, you, no, no, you're no. no, 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 no. Sh sh should we go down with all colours wet? <laughs> um, <laughs> in which case, I would choose uh, this um, lad here with the, the pen holder. The leader, yes, he spoke of the pen holder. Was he? True oh, this time, or was jolly. it a bluff? 
Well done. Oh. Well done. Oh. Yeah. It's a pen holder. It's a pen holder. And we must swiftly get another one in. Who knows what's going to happen? Because this is going to be the last one. Goke, Frank, rather swiftly, please. The difference between the verb to goke and to goggle is very, very subtle. Uh, to goggle is to uh, is to widen the eyes with as though you can't understand what's going on. You're absolutely amazed. And to goke, it's just to widen your eyes for any purpose, but not the same as widening it. Yeah, very nice, Frank. Tip. All districts. Turn. I've got a bit of a yarn. It's rope or yarn, but it's the middle bit of the rope is the goke, what goes through the middle, and sometimes it's different colours, so an expert goke observer could tell where the rope was made. What about you now, really? A goke is a sort of wheelbarrow that they use in the Hebrides, and um, they carry turves in it. <laughs> and well what happens is... <laughs> they carry... Turves. Turves. Oh, good. And... <laughs> <laughs> time's running on. Oh, yes, time's running on. And uh, they've got extra high sides and fronts so they can get a lot of turves in it. So, it's a sort of a wheelbarrow. It's um, a, the middle part of a rope. And I really can't remember what Frank Muir said. <laughs> it's a, it's a oh, yeah, opening widening the eyes, but not a astonishment. Thank you, I Frank. I remember it only too w well. Widening the eyes. Now, Patrick. Do I have a quarter of an hour, sir? No, <laughs> you must the... answer instantly. Well, uh, we, don't have, we don't have ropes with the kind of things in the middle. Uh, uh, nobody opened it. Uh, it's just an opening of the eye. Opening of the eye, Frank, to all blood. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> <laughs> we just before we all go home and don't come back again for a long time. Let's see who who had the true one. Let's see the true one. Oh, got to be there. <laughs> the call the boat. Well, there you are. We, you couldn't hope, really, could we? I don't know what the team leaders feel, but to end on a happier note than for all yet again for our last programme. Oh. Perhaps you'd like to applaud oh. both sides. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> all, all that all that, all that effort, and they ended up exactly as they started. It is really rather pleasing. Well, the words with the broken springs are going to have to lie a while in the Oxford English Dictionary because this is the last programme of the present series. And so, for the time being, goodbye from Ian Ogilvy. <laughs> Tim Rice. <laughs> Diane Keane. Mary Hughes. Patrick Campbell. Goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs> and goodbye. <laughs>